My name is Oli, I'm a doctor and YouTuber. I'm Taymor, I'm a data scientist and writer. And you're listening to Not Overthinking, the weekly podcast where we think about happiness, creativity and the human condition. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Not Overthinking. Taymor, how are you doing on this fine day? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. Uh, I'm in Japan now. I got here a few days ago. Um, I'll be here for the next four weeks, roughly. Um, just sort of working remotely. And one of my friends uh, from university is doing a PhD here, so hanging out with him. Um, so yeah, interesting place so far. Yesterday we uh, we went hiking up some like waterfall thing, and afterwards we had a very nice interaction with an with an old guy who who built his own little cafe and his own little treehouse. Dude is like 75 years old and he like, yeah, climbs up this tree to get to the roof of the tree house. He like built this cafe and stuff. He actually used to be a doctor, worked as a doctor for most of his life then retired uh, and came back from Tokyo to Okinawa, which is the island where I'm staying. And uh, yeah, kind of runs this cafe, runs this Airbnb, builds stuff. Guy was, guy was a legend. I think like old people in Japan are really, really active and really kind of healthy. Oh man, that sounds pretty ideal. Like an ideal life <laughs> post retiring from being a doctor, building your own tree house, yeah. build, building your own cafe. D- dude has a bunch of other side hustles as well. He has a side hustle where he imports some medical device from Germany and sells it in Tokyo. And that's that's what that's another business he's just got going on the side. And uh yeah, the guy the guy was awesome. He, he has an Instagram account um where he like yeah, I guess posts about his Airbnb and his cafe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was great Aww. to see like someone that's, that old that's doing so sweet. really cool yeah. things. <laughs> Yeah, how have you been? I've been all right. Uh, this is my first day off after 12 solid days of work. Um, so I had a had a really big line this morning and then had a brunch with a few friends and I went to the gym, you know, doing doing all of this, all of this like pedestrian life stuff. But like, I was going to ask you because <laughs> every time I tell people about the sort of lifestyle you're living where you, you, your startup has just got funded and now you're traveling the world and living in Hawaii for a week and then Japan for a month, like everyone's like, oh my God, he's like living the dream. And so I was wondering what, to what extent you are actually living the dream versus to what extent extent this is a kind of a story that people think that you're you're living if that makes sense yeah this is something i've been thinking about because i think okay to be clear i'm having a great time we're incredibly fortunate to be able to do what we're doing it's it's sick like i could not imagine (laughs) doing anything more cool with my life so i mean i think it's amazing but i do think the internal experience of well i've been thinking a lot recently about this our our sort of internal experiences of things and the sort of external kind of uh way there's a sort of way it looks i think when when you know, obviously like we judge things based on how they appear externally um whereas we kind of feel things based on like the the internal side of it and so when you kind i think when you kind of look at someone's life and it's like oh this person's like traveling around and he's at these like really beautiful locations and all of this kind of stuff and like a, as an external viewer that's the only glimpse of it that you have and so i think you probably overweight the the outward appearance of it whereas i would say the out the outward like appearance of it is a small part part of my the sort of day-to-day experience of living it you know most of the time like we're working on the startup we're thinking about the startup all you know all the same like stuff that would come with that were we in the UK or in the US or whatever and there's like an interesting backdrop of being in a new country and, and occasionally doing cool things like hiking up a waterfall on a Saturday but yeah, I just think the internal experience is very different to the external one. Does that make sense? Oh, so you know what this reminds me of? Have you read uh, Tim Urban's article called Life is a Picture? Sorry, you broke off there. Can you say that again? Have you read Tim Urban's article called Life is a Picture? Oh, it rings a bell, but I can't remember exactly what it's about. Why don't you summarize it? So so, so his, his, his I think it's it's called something like Life is a Picture, but we live in a pixel. And it's his his, his whole thing is that it's, it's very easy to look at someone like Mark Zuckerberg's life and say, oh, wow, you you know, you're the CEO of Facebook, you've got a load of money, you must have a great life because all we're seeing is like the broad brushstroke picture. Whereas actually on a given day, we live in a single pixel within that whole picture. And so when we imagine ourselves into the future and we think, oh, you know, when I'm rich and famous and have like a house and a bigger car and stuff, we imagine it in those broad brushstrokes. But what we don't realize when we're doing this sort of daydreaming or when we're comparing our lives to others is that actually it is just about the day-to-day experience and the whole life story is made up of just a lot number of todays and so it's really all about optimizing your today rather than optimizing this like you know broad sweeping brushstroke picture of oh this life sounds pretty cool and i think that's sort of what you're getting at as well yeah 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 that's exactly it but but to be honest i've been thinking that like i i i I think i it would help me if i lived less internally and more sort of externally and like didn't live in my head so much and sort of could get more value out of like being in a really beautiful place for example uh, rather than just living in my head and i happen to be physically located somewhere cool 
cool, you know? And, and to, to be clear, I do get a decent amount of value out of it. I think it's awesome. But I'm sure I could be, you know, getting out of my head a bit more. I think Naval, you know, Naval Ravikant goes on about this. I'm sure you've heard the legendary uh, podcast of him uh, with Shane Parrish, uh, at the Knowledge Project podcast, where, and, and a lot of what he talks about is like trying to make a conscious effort to get out of his own head. I guess this comes, this is like related to things like mindfulness and meditation, where he says that like, you know, back in the day when he'd be brushing his teeth, he'd be like, I don't know, fantasizing about the future or, or, or like reflecting, and not reflecting, but just like replaying events in the past. And he's like, you know, it, it's, it's all this like living in the moment kind of stuff, basically. Yeah, I've definitely come across this stuff a lot on <laughs> on the on the, on the podcast circuit, uh, which is probably the same podcast that you've been listening to in the same kind of books and the same kind of tweets. Um, it's something that I'm actively thinking about a lot as well. Um, and one thing that, that really drove the point home for me was I think an article that Tynan wrote about it on his blog where he was talking about like the pleasure of washing the dishes. Um, and previously when, when washing dishes, I'd always be sort of thinking of it as, uh, okay, I'm washing the dishes, but I'd really rather, rather be doing something else. But then when I started thinking about it as if, you know, enjoying the process of washing <laughs> washing the dishes and trying to like make the dishes as clean as they could be, yeah. um, it just sort of added a little bit more enjoyment. So I'm also trying to actively think about that stuff a little bit more. Oh, it's really anyway. funny. It's, really, wait, wait, it's, it's really funny that you give the washing the dishes example, because one thought I keep coming back to over the past few weeks is that washing your hands is actually really fun. <laughs> washing your hands is like, you, you, you should do that as like a five minute break activity because it's really, yeah, it's, it's really fun. Like if it's a hot day and you're washing your hands with like cold water and nice smelling soap, just like, you know, the, the tactile feeling of your hands rubbing together feels really nice. The water on your hands feels really nice. If it's a cold day and you're washing your hands with hot water, it feels amazing. Like hand washing is so underrated. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, it's it's normally at the end of the podcast that we have our insight of the week. So, but I guess I guess, I guess we've gotten in yours early. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, all right, we better start the podcast. Although, actually, on that note, uh, uh, the the phrase that just came to mind was the old uh, "pleasure of the flesh" uh, that you yes. coined in our one of our recent episodes about should you buy a new iPhone. And the other day, uh, a, f a few days ago, I, I released a YouTube video, basically kind of leeching off of the the points we made in that podcast and turning it into like a little flowchart. Um, and one of the comments, uh, one of the slightly mean comments was from someone saying oh my god i can't believe i've just watched this video it was so much better when you discussed it on the podcast but now it's as if you've just rehashed the content and you're repeating the same jokes uh i really love the podcast and i, and I hate your videos oh, nice. <laughs> or, 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 or something to that effect Great comment. And i was thinking damn <laughs> he is so spot on i was fully reusing all the uh, snapdragon jokes and everything like that and trying to make it come across as if they were just spontaneous nice. but hey anyway what are we talking about today? So I thought this week we'd talk about um, the topic of being weird. And this is something that I think we've, it's sort of related to lots of things that we've talked about on the podcast before. And it's something that I've started thinking very actively about. I uh, just, uh, just want to give a heads up to the listeners that there is about a one second delay between me and Ali. So when I say something, he hears it one second later. And so during this podcast, there may be times where we talk over each other or, you know, bits where it feels kind of awkward or stilted. Um, and that'll be because of that. And that's um, not because we're all or stilted it's because there's a delay is what you're saying exactly exactly it's it's harder to convince people of that in real life it's like no, i'm not i'm not being awkward there's you know i just it's just yeah there's some kind of communication delay yeah. here <laughs> what's going on yeah um yeah okay so the topic of being weird so there were a couple of uh tweets essentially that sort of uh sparked this so last night for me uh I'll, I'll read i'll read them out so the first is by someone called uh mason hartman uh she is one of my favorite sort of twitter accounts to follow uh and she is very big on like being weird in general. And she, she tweeted uh, a couple of weeks ago, if you're following me or following enough people adjacent to me to see this, and you're not spending quite a lot of your time doing something weird that concerns your friends and or family, you need to get on that nerd. You only have one life to live. Um, and she follows it up with uh, a couple of more tweets, uh, which I guess are yeah, uh, sort of add-ons and we can link to the thread. Uh, so she's essentially saying, if you're not if you're not doing something that at least a few friends or family members think is kind of weird, you probably should be. Um, Another th another person that sort of gives a nod to this is a, a guy called Patrick Collison. He's the founder of a, a company called Stripe, uh, you know, probably like the darling tech company in Silicon Valley right now. Uh, and he says, he says, if you're in the US and go to a good school, there are a lot of forces that will push you towards following train tracks laid by others rather than charting a course yourself. Make sure that the things you're pursuing are weird things that you want to pursue, not whatever the standard path is. As a heuristic, do your friends at school think your path is a bit strange? If not, maybe it's too normal. Uh, so both these people are kind of advocating for being weird. Um, and I, I, yeah, I've kind of found myself thinking that, yeah, I just completely echo what they're saying that like surely, you know, human beings are all like, 
very different. And surely each of us, if we allowed ourselves to cultivate our own interests and kind of, in inverted commas, be ourselves, there would, you know, everyone would have a few weird things that no one else, you know, that their friends and family don't really get, don't really understand, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but I think, yeah, a lot of the time it's like, I, I don't know, we sort of subconsciously suppress it or something. I, I don't know. What, what are your sort of cursory thoughts on, on what I've just said? Um, so my cursory thoughts is that I really want to agree with this stuff, but I think I really want to agree with it because uh, I sort of, I feel like I fall nicely into that category of people whose school friends would probably think that the thing I'm doing is a little bit weird. Um, and that's why partly I don't want to agree with it too, uh, sort of too staunchly because it'll just, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned it'll just come across as me trying to like pat myself on the back for patting yourself back. Charting, yeah, yeah for, for, for charting a course that's slightly different to what the standard medical student slash junior doctor would be doing by having a YouTube channel and, and stuff. Uh, but yeah, I definitely think there's there's some merit to it. And, you, you know, <laughs> if there's one thing I preach, it's that people should develop side interests and hobbies and things and sort of, you know, follow, follow their passions in that regard and not worry so much about the traditional train track career path uh, that we all spend far too much time worrying about. So on that level, it, it immediately resonates. What's, so you're, you're, you know, you're pretty happy with being weird and stuff nowadays. What, what was your sort of journey to getting there? Like when you were, at what point did you start becoming conscious of like weird, weirdness and like how society might perceive you? Um, so thinking back, I think the earliest example I can think of is when I started, uh, sort of, it's, it's it's not even that weird, but it was. I think I think I think I've mentioned this in a previous episode where 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 we we talked about the difficulty of, of talking to girls. Um, and back in the day when like my crutch for talking to girls used to be that I got super into these like you know girly TV shows like Gossip Girl and Nine or Two One Zero and the Vampire Diaries and things. And so the way in which I started initially expressing my quote, weirdness in those was by sort of acting like a girl when talking about those things. Like oh my god, Chase Crawford is so hot. You know, like yeah, yeah, that yeah. level of stuff, which was fully an act but it was sort of it was it was weird for a guy to be doing that sort of thing and it always resulted in intrigued in intrigued and intriguing reactions from other people and so i kind of embraced that weird side of it ah, okay so that was like weird as a as an attention as a deliberately attention seeking tactic yeah definitely and also i think things like singing in public and and stuff just like casually singing in the corridors and stuff was also deliberately weird in an attention seeking kind of way um and so kind of I <laughs> I've, I've never quite thought about it in that context before, but I think I certainly used to be a big attention seeker back in the day and that hasn't really changed much. <laughs> what about you? Like, you, when did you start being weird and deviating from the norm? Because I, I feel like in early secondary school, you were very kind of standard. Like you'd be hanging out at the girls' school at lunchtime and texting females after school and, and stuff, which is kind of absolutely not weird. Uh, I suppose it's weird for the people that we used to hang out with, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not, so, it's not traditionally weird. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's, uh, that's maybe why I thought this stuff is quite interesting and sort of worth talking about because I feel like I had phases of my life where I had a different a different relationship with like weirdness and like I think in I think in primary school I was like my peak self I was like no, we've been through this before in primary school I was just like a super chill authentic great guy you know everyone loved it I was yeah I was friends with everyone I was just completely being myself I, did, I didn't have like the background thread running in my head of like analyzing things I was just like completely free and completely sort of authentic and a lot of the things I happened to be into were kind of non-standard I suppose um I was really into gardening I really uh yeah I, I was su super into sort of gardening and uh pets and like fish keeping and that kind of thing uh I, I really liked sort of yeah you know, a lot of, I guess a lot of things that would not be considered uh traditionally masculine uh which is uh, you know how most people look at me now uh I I, <laughs> I used to <laughs> Yeah, I, I used to be into a lot of that kind of stuff, um, which looking back was, you know, a lot of it was sort of non-standard. I guess in primary school, no one actually cares. Um, and so it was just like fine. But I think when I got to secondary school, I became acutely aware of like what is what is standard and what is weird and stuff like that. Uh, and I very much wanted to be uh, quote unquote normal. And so I think at the start of secondary school, uh, there was definitely a lot of that, uh, a lot of kind of suppressing uh, my sort of natural inclinations towards things. 
things in order to try and be cool and fit in and all of that kind of stuff. I'm sure a lot of people go through that. Um, but then I think probably around like, yeah, I'd say like in primary school, no one cares, like weird, weird or not, it's fine. I'd say like the first few years of secondary school, so maybe like age 11 to 15 or so, I think everyone wants to fit in and no one wants to be different or weird. Then I think around age 15, certainly I felt like this happened in our year anyway, like being a little bit quirky or having like some weird niche thing that you do was like kind of cool at that point. And so I remember like one guy got into like calligraphy for some reason and like bought like a calligraphy pen and, and then a bunch of other people like some kinds of calligraphy and um, <laughs> yeah, just like sort of things like, and, and then and then the whole like, uh, I guess like being into Pokemon was now cool. And it was like, oh, haha, you're so like edgy and random that you still like Pokemon when you age 16 or whatever, uh, which really used to grind my gears because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I think you, you know why I used to grind my gears. Um, but yeah, I think around like age 15, 16, then being slightly weird or, uh, was like cool. Um, and I think from that point onwards, I was then more happy to kind of be weird and, and yeah, kind of put myself out there in, in front of sort of the rest of my year group and stuff like that by, you know, making stupid websites and posting them on Facebook and, you know, yeah, we've talked about this a bit, making random YouTube videos and that kind of stuff. Um, but then I think at university... No, I, I, I think weird was fine at university. So, I, I, yeah, I think, I mean, do you agree with that sort of summary of like primary school, then start of secondary school, then end of secondary school? Yeah, I think that's the, that pretty much matches onto my experience of it as well. Like in, in primary school, like no one really cares. Um, we used to play Yu-Gi-Oh and Beyblades and stuff in, you know, break time, willy nilly, not really caring what anyone thought. Uh, to, towards like the start of secondary school, where there's more of a pressure to fit in, that sort of stuff died down. But then towards the end, uh, towards the end of secondary school, again, people get to the point where they don't really care anymore and so my main source of weirdness in secondary school was towards the end becoming a magician and then that was a real source of kind of uh status amongst my peers at least in my year because it was kind of cool and kind of quirky i think but also doing the whole kind of website thing and setting up random businesses although i think i was less public about the whole just being weird front than than you were at the time and then at university again like it it's such a, a th that was one of the things i really liked about university that it's such an accepting environment of weirdness that i don't think anyone i at least I would hope that very few people feel this desire to quote fit in um, because it seemed like genuinely there was something for everyone. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So in this start of secondary school period, were you like suppressing any weird things about yourself? Like, I mean, you've alluded to not really caring about fitting in back then before on this podcast. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think I was. Like the the quote weird things about me at the start of secondary school were, were, were that, that I really liked maths and I thought I was sick of maths. And then I got really into the whole computer thing. But then like the people who I, I was closest friends with were also massive nerds and super into maths to the point that we'd be sort of competing against each other on tests but and we're also into the computer thing and so like i never really interacted much with the sort of the cool kid group who would think Hello. it weird to be into maths and into computers i suppose partly All because right, at the time you. my identity was based around kind of being very academic and you know being the sort of guy who's into maths and computers and so in a way i actively propagated that rather than trying to suppress it for some you know need to fit into the football team are you back with us i am back sorry about that my internet cuts out every now and then the internet here at the hotel is not great so I, when i the last thing i heard you say was that all your friends were math nerds yeah so the point i was making was that um it, it was easy for me to be weird in that sense because my whole identity was tied up with being academic and therefore into maths and into computers and stuff as were all my friends and i never really tried to fit in with the football team uh, to kind of use the stereotype yeah but like i think i i feel like think th thinking back and thinking about the people that i quote admire uh in in life it's all it's, it's always been the people who have weird you know weird slash quirky interests and often i think i think i have a real problem in that if if i meet someone who appears on the surface to not have any hobbies beyond like going home and watching netflix or hanging out with friends at the mall then i would i i, I automatically feel this kind of in a way sense of uh a sense that i possibly respect them a bit less or uh, i think that's like a crass i think i think that's a crass way of putting it but like i feel like i certainly respect people more who i think have unusual or quirky interests if that makes sense i get what you mean i think your 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 framing of it is pretty problematic um but but look i i totally get what you mean i think 
I think maybe you don't mean like you respect them less, but I, f I think I think there is something to be said for. Oh, okay. This I think this is related to a blog post that I wrote um, not too long ago. I don't. Did we ever talk about it on the podcast? It's about like when you find out that someone has like a guilty pleasure. Oh, I think you might have mentioned it as an insight, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so rehash that. So the, the gist of this blog post is that I think one of the really special moments is like in life is when you find out someone else's sort of guilty or secret pleasure. Um, and I don't. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'll sort of read out some snippets from the blog post. I don't mean the whole like. Oh, I, I sometimes eat a whole tub of ice cream when I'm home alone, haha, -ha. or like, you know, that, that kind of stuff. I mean, like the kind of stuff, you find out something that is, that this other person, it just does not tell anyone about because it's extremely weird and they're kind of embarrassed about it. And I think the amazing part of finding one of these things is that when you find it, you know that they are, you know that, that that's like true authenticity. I think with most things, like for example, if someone is into like, if someone's into running, like someone's really into running or like fitness or something, it's like, yeah, I'm sure part of that is a reflection on their personality and themselves in some way. Um, but there's also other forces that make it easy to be into running or that sort of reward being into running. For example, it makes you sort of healthy and stuff and, you know, maybe it keeps you in good shape and society kind of values that. Um, and so you can, it, it's sort of like a positive signal to other people. Um, and then the other thing is that like, yeah, so I, I, in the blog post, I sort of split up the reasons, uh, the forces that influence us when we do things into social signaling, which is like, we're doing this thing, maybe subconsciously, maybe not, because in some sense it gets us some kind of yeah it, it makes other people see, see us as more high value um so like some interests and some hobbies are kind of like that like uh you know, fitness or whatever uh, and the other is what i call social appropriation where the where the fact that we're doing something is sort of influenced by sort of just the the implicit structures in society so for example if all your friends have read sapiens the fact that you've read sapiens doesn't really say too much about you because chances are you've read it because uh, you know a bunch of your friends recommended it or whatever Whereas if, you know, none of your friends have read Sapiens and within that group, you're the guy who's read Sapiens, then that maybe says a bit more about you because you've kind of had to seek this thing out. Um, anyway, my point is when I think we're all looking for some level of like authenticity and trying to sort of get to know how other people really are. And with a lot of things, you can't really get too much signal for how they really are because there's all these other forces. Um, but when you find out something that someone is embarrassed about telling people, you know that that is pretty much authentic because like it's it's going to be a weird, embarrassing thing. So it's not like all their friends are doing it and that's why they're doing it. Or it's not like, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh cards are just really popular in school at the moment. That's why they're playing Yu-Gi-Oh. It's like, uh, you, you can be sure that that's come from somewhere deep and internal. And also the fact that they're embarrassed about telling people and that they don't tell people about it means that there's no element of like social signaling. They're not, you know, they don't get any reward from society for doing this thing. And so when you find out something uh, like a very guilty pleasure of someone's, I think that's one of the few moments in which you, uh, that sort of real, reveals something really authentic about them. Um, and I think this is kind of, I think this is very related to this kind of thing where I really like it when I find out s that someone has some like weird niche interest because it's like, whoa, okay. If you, uh, for example, uh, there's sort of like a now friend of mine who's uh, at university, um, who's a few years younger and uh, in a lot of ways reminds me of myself. And he, before starting university, got into hydroponics. Do you know what hydroponics is? No, never heard of it. What is hydroponics it? is like high tech farming. It's like you get this like super high tech it's like indoor farming you get some like crazy high tech gel it has it, you have like a bunch of sensors monitoring like all the nutrients and the water parameters all this kind of stuff in the gel and you kind of grow these plants like you know, vegetables and things in this gel uh, it's like high tech kind of indoor gardening um, and he like he got into this like age 16 <laughs> before university and kind of st still does it like at home he has a little hydroponics garden and I thought that was amazing like if you discover something like that that's got to say something about this person and like I feel like you're seeing something real about this person there because there's there's really not many forces that would push someone into <laughs> getting into hydroponics at age 16 and so I I, I want to push back on your your thing about you sort of respecting people less if they don't have stuff like that because I don't think I don't think you actually do that I think it's more of like when you find so when you when you find someone who does have something like that it's like whoa I'm like seeing the real person right now whereas you know if you're having conversation with someone and all you've discovered about them is that you know they like watching Netflix in the evenings and hanging out with their mates I would say that like you know th there's more to find out about them at that point it's like you haven't really seen anything real about them yet okay so I want to push that uh, I want to push back on that a little bit because it's, it's it sounds like what you're saying is that everyone has uh sort of interests such as hydroponics or you know or equivalent it's just that 
you have to dig deep enough to uncover those interests. Whereas I'm not sure that's true. Like I can think like the majority of people that I know quite well don't have interests like hydroponics and their interests are a lot more, shall we say, pedestrian. Uh, sure. We're, we're talking about interest right now in a very tangible sense of this is a hobby or activity that I do. What I'm saying is that, I mean, I agree, like most, you know, most people don't have an interest like hydroponics. I certainly don't have an interest like hydroponics. I don't have any like weird activity hobby that I do. But I would say that most people have like, have their own like sense of weirdness that they probably are suppressing or that it takes some work to get to because they're not used to revealing it. But like, if you think about all your friends, a lot of, you know, a lot of them on the surface seem pretty normy to use, uh, t- to use that term. But I'm sure like the fact that you know them intimately since they're your very close friends, you know, like the weird things about them and the, yeah, and the kind of weird things that they do, right? Like, would you say you have any, any, any friends who you know really, really well who genuinely don't have any like weird thing about them? I think it depends on, on the definition of weird. Like, what do you mean by weird? I guess, yeah, by, by weird, I mean something that, uh, yeah, it comes back to the two forces of social signaling and social appropriation, where I think it's weird if society doesn't reward it inherently. Uh, and it's weird if there are, you know, if the current zeitgeist d- is, is not pushing you towards doing this thing. I mean, honestly, I can't think of many friends that, that I know who have things like that. And I, I, I can't think of, of that even within myself or within you, really. Like, I don't think either of us have things that are equivalent to hydroponics that are, in a, in a way, guilty pleasures that we kind of don't want other people to know about. I suppose one of the things for me would be, you know, being really into paranormal romance literature, which I think is really is just really great. Um, but it's also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to talking about it because I'm open to sort of actively expressing that slightly weird side of myself. And I think most people that I know that I would be friends with are also probably okay with expressing that slightly weird side of themselves if they had interests like that. Yeah, my whole point here is that I th- I think I'm not weird enough. I think, I I think for example, uh, okay, maybe there's different categories of weird. Like, you know, for example, running a YouTube channel is kind of weird and, and pretty sort of non-standard. But at the same time, it does, you know, it has positive signaling effects. Like society rewards you for doing this thing. And also the current zeitgeist is very much like about, you know, people having YouTube channels and blogs and podcasts and whatnot. So like, there are obvious forces that push you into doing this thing. And so it, it's it's a different category of weird to, I guess, the hydroponics thing. Or one of my friends has an Instagram account where she posts gifts of Rick Grimes, who is the main guy from The Walking Dead. And this is just like an anonymous Instagram account. That, that kind of thing where like, do you, do you know what I mean? And I, and I feel like back in the day, I probably, you know, back in like primary school and stuff, I, I think I would, I would have had more things that I used to do or be interested in that didn't reward that society didn't reward me for and that I didn't really get from other people around me but now I don't really like the stuff I spend most of my time doing it's it's non-standard compared to I guess non-tech people but it's a it's a very standard path in the sort of expanded box that I've found myself uh, inhabiting I don't really have that I mean, many weird things anymore so I'd suggest that maybe a reason for that is that when when we were in primary school and early secondary school we had like genuinely had far more time to explore whatever interest we wanted to and so if you decided that you were interested interested in knitting, you could literally spend eight hours a day for like, you know, several months getting really, really super into knitting. But that's something that's just not like genuinely unfeasible for most people listening to this podcast and for you and me now, because we have so many extra demands on our time. And so I feel like a lot of the things that we make the active decision to do are the things that reward us in some way, whether it's societally or financially or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I guess that's true. So so one thing that I was I was thinking about when we, when we were talking about this stuff about um, guilty pleasures and stuff. Uh, I recently read on someone's uh, Hinge profile. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Hinge is a dating app that I, I happen to be on. So, you know, come, come find me on Hinge if, you, if you're interested, lol. Uh, I read on someone's da- Hinge, Hinge dating profile. It was, it was uh, the, the question that they answered on the profile was what's something, uh, something about you that no one expects or, you know, s- something to that effect. And this, and this girl's response was something along the lines of I really love uh, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet modeling nice. or something like that like that and i was like whoa that is <laughs> that's fantastic that would make for a great conversation um so i think i i dropped a cheeky like on that and said hey, hey have you ever, ever heard of causal uh, but you never replied to me so uh clearly clearly not <laughs> perhaps if you were a bit more famous Taymor, then people would know what causal is yeah um and and also i met someone a few months ago who has this like quirky thing that she has a pet crow that she rescued on the street one day and is nursed back to health and sort of has an instagram account of her pet crow and i was like oh this is really cool because it's that's all awesome. it, it's 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 kind of weird it's what most people would think is weird and i think that sort of gave me a lot of respect towards this person for having 
such a quote, weird uh, thing that they did on the side. So kind of going back to that um, sort of garbled statement that I made that I'd respect people less for not being weird. I don't think, yeah, I it's it's not quite that. It's just more that I think it's, I find it very impressive slash admirable when people are kind of open about expressing things that traditionally would be seen as weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, I totally agree. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, I, I think that all makes sense. I think the, I think I've come across that Hinge profile. <laughs> Um, <laughs> or maybe Did a friend sent a message about causal. Yeah, I think or I think maybe a friend sent me a screenshot of it because of the spreadsheet thing, which is obviously uh, interesting to me. Um, so spreadsheet girl, if you happen to be listening to this, do reach out because clearly both of us are interested. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so I yeah I think the I think there's a distinction to be made between like the expanding the box kind of weirdness which we talked about a few episodes ago, where like you know what you happen you know, how you spend a, a lot of your time you know your job and stuff um yeah it, like as a for example i imagine you don't feel you know in like yeah, yeah you're probably friends with a lot of like youtube people and like it's pretty standard to have a youtube channel amongst youtube people for example it's also pretty standard to like be doing your own startup amongst tech people so, so i see that more of as as an expanding expanding the box kind of weirdness and i think you know uh, all the stuff we said about why it's worthwhile to expand the box i think that applies there where like if you stay in the same box sort of that you were kind of born in and that you're sort of put in by default you're probably missing out on gains to be had in, in all parts of your life. But I do, I think there's a different kind of weirdness, which is uh, the one I alluded to in my blog post about like doing these things that society doesn't value and that society isn't pushing you towards doing. And my point here is that I, you know, chant, just, I guess I have a fundamental belief that most people are pretty like unique or whatever. You know, maybe this is some like romantic BS that I've been fed by modern day society about people being unique or something. I don't know. Um, but I feel like most people are pretty unique and and if you if if there isn't anything that you do or sort of yeah that you sort of do or learn about or sort of interested in that a society doesn't value and b society doesn't push you towards then you're probably suppressing it like if you, you probably you almost certainly have these thing these sort of interests or you're drawn to these things that you're not really cultivating for some reason do you, do you agree with that like if you don't have any i don't think you and i really do have any of these things right now i mean, maybe we browse like weird subreddits at some uh, or like read paranormal fiction or something but i don't really feel like i have any of these things and i feel like that's kind of bad because i'm probably suppressing the things that i do have like i feel like fish keeping might be it and i've said before i want to get back into fish keeping um but i'm not really cultivating that enough but I mean, also, like, in, in the circles that you roam in, like, being into fish keeping isn't that weird. Like, it would be very standard to have be into fish keeping and have a little Instagram page where you post fish keeping tips and <laughs> maybe even posting about fish keeping on a category on your blog. Like, it feel, like I think the more you expand the box in the realm of a sort of, in the realm of being okay with weirdness, and most of the circles that you and I roam in are completely okay with weirdness, the less this this slightly weird stuff becomes weird. Like, yeah, it would be weird to be into fish keeping when you're in year seven, but, like, when you're 20, 25 and you know, university grad working on your own startup like no one like it's it's not it's not that weird at all no so I, I guess the frame the the weird versus non-weird framing i think is bad and the better way to frame it is something along the lines of you know if everything you're doing is stuff that society values or stuff that society is pushing you towards doing then you're probably not doing a lot of things that you could be getting a lot of value out of i think i i think the term weird mm -hmm. just probably doesn't help because it's kind of bit a lot of other stuff is baked into it but if if all the things you do are things that society values and that society pushes you towards, you're probably missing out on stuff. That's my point here. And I think we should move away from okay. the weird, weird framing. But then we're also moving more into this world that really values individuality and kind of going back to this idea of having a personal blog or a YouTube channel. Like I can feasibly imagine, imagine that almost anything that I would be into would actually be good content for YouTube videos. Yeah. Almost any yeah. new hobby that you come up with is going to be good content for the blog. Like unless it's something really that, like, you know, societally completely unacceptable to talk about, like, you know, hypothetically your favorite genre of pornography or you know thing, things in that domain are still you know people would naturally suppress those and we probably wouldn't say that oh mate you aren't being fully authentic by not sharing that kind of detail with random people that you meet uh, beyond like that like sexual domain of stuff I can't think of many things that people would have interest in that they would actively suppress these days yeah I think I think that's that's a good point about the fact that and, and yeah I, I've often thought this about like your whole YouTube thing where it basically allows you to sort of monetize your, the rest of your life like I 
having like a, a personal brand and stuff means that you know whatever you do you can extract some like tangible value out of it in terms of like money or influence or whatever and i think that's a really cool thing about um yeah the sort of i guess influencer movement or whatever just like the personal identity online movement that you can kind of you can you can sort of share yeah share every weird thing about yourself and people kind of get some value out of this thing um yeah and i think there's actually an outsized value that you get for for sharing things that are slightly more weird like if i became into running that's not you know that particular it's, it's not particularly interesting but if i were to make a series of videos about how much i love the paranormal romance genre of fiction that would just be an inherently more yeah just quirky eccentric and therefore more valued i think yeah ah oh, damn i guess the real weird is being really normy now <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Just going home and watching Netflix. <laughs> it's, oh, it's like it's like your uh, your recent tweet that what was it? V- oh, the video or retweet it. Can yeah. you read that out for us? Because I think that's really good. Um, I'll read. Look, I'll read it out. I'm sure some of it will be lost in translation because it's a tweet format. Basically, there's this there's this format of tweets that was doing the rounds like in the past couple of weeks. Where um, all right, I'll 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 read I'll read my tweet out. All right, the tweet is, I saw a guy on the plane today. No laptop, no iPad, no Bluetooth noise-canceling headphones. He just sat there with the complimentary headphones, watching the in-flight entertainment like a psychopath. And this is like the, the, the sort of tweet format is you describe someone doing this thing that is very that is like ostensibly very normal, but somehow society has found itself in a place where it's not the norm, and you describe them as a psychopath. So like people in, in sort of the startup scene and the tech scene joke about, you know, I, I, saw, I saw a startup founder today, um, you know, he... Um, uh, you know, you know, no, no TechCrunch blog announcement, no Twitter account. He just sat there running a profitable business like a psychopath. You know, <laughs> like um, so, so stuff like this. Um, and so, I don't know how we got onto that, but it yeah, was, I, I, I think it was your comment about maybe being normie is the new weird. Yeah, yeah, the normie, norm, normieism is is making a comeback potentially. Mm-hmm. So. I'm not really sure we got anywhere in this in this discussion. So we talked a bit about sort of it. It seems it seems like the opening tweets that you read out seem to value this idea of being weird and being weird as defined by things that your school friends would probably think are a little bit rogue. And I think for both you and me, you know, our, our school friends would think that the things that we're doing are a little bit rogue. Um, and even though for you, I know that doing the whole startup scene is just standard amongst the tech community. Like most of most of your friends at school were not part of the tech community. Yeah, which sure. still would p- probably find it a bit weird that you're in Japan living in a treehouse and coding on your startup from your laptop um or things or things like that and i just wonder i'd I'd be curious to hear from our audience if anyone fancies emailing in like do you have anything in your life that you do that your school friends would think is a little bit weird um if we if 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 i think back to molly um i won't ask her consent for this but i'm sure she won't mind she runs a food a food instagram account cambridge.foodie we'll link it down below she always appreciates it whenever she gets an influx of followers um that's kind of a bit weird and like if if you know you told her friends at school that you know she'd be running a food instagram account and be getting free meals and stuff that would probably be in the realm of oh okay that's that's, that's kind of weird but like in a, in like a good way um and i just I, I suspect that most of my friends do do things that their previous secondary school selves would have thought of it as a little bit weird um but i'd be curious to hear what kind of weirdness we've got from our listeners yeah that'll be that'll be really interesting uh yeah i think to sum up i think we have made a bit of progress in like making a distinction between types of weirdness and i think that the tweets that are saying that uh you know more people should be more weird i think that uh, and I think doing things that your old friends and family consider to be weird, I think that is a nod to our expanding the box thing because your your sort of family and your kind of old friends represent your box, right? And if if you're not doing any, anything that they consider weird, you haven't really expanded the box. And I think that's what that's alluding to, that you should expand the box in that way. Um, and I think that's one kind of weirdness that is valuable. And then the other one is, I think, yeah, it's this thing about like, is do you do anything that A, society doesn't value <laughs> and B, society is important pushing you towards and I, it seems like you disagree with me on this Ali but I kind of feel like we all probably have these things that we would be interested in that we just aren't cultivating because society doesn't value them and because society isn't pushing us towards them but we could be getting a lot of value from them if we did do them yeah I think I think that's a, a reasonable summary of the discussion um so do you have any insights of the week other than uh, what was the insight you came up with earlier <laughs> I can't even remember what hand washing oh my god okay I think everyone should try this you should try this too by the way just like you know in between your activities Wait, or whatever so- so, just go and so wash you're saying hands. after going to the toilet, I should wash my hands. <laughs> Very good. That was really good. 
Um, but yeah, just look, just try hand washing as an activity. Like if you have a couple of minutes in between tasks, just, just go and wash your hands. It's amazing. Um, but I do have an insight actually, and I wanted to talk to you about this. I recently finished a book. You'll be very proud of me for Oh, this. congratulations. Uh, furthermore, it's a book that you recommended. It's Ready Player One. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and I have some thoughts. It, look, it was it was a good book. Look, I, I was like, I was, I was gripped. I was engrossed. I read it over. I mean, I tried started reading it for a while, but every, I'd have lots of sessions where I sit down and read it for about two minutes and it wasn't that interesting and I get bored. And I had enough of these sessions and I had a 40 minute Uber ride in which there was nothing else to do. And then I read it for about 15 minutes straight and got into like a really good bit and then I got hooked. And I ended up finishing the book in a few days. It was really, it was great story, really liked that. The thing I wasn't a fan of was that it made me sort of absent from the rest of my life, if I'm honest with you, mate. It's like when you're engrossed in a, t you're like, you know, three seasons deep into Lost, which has like six seasons or something. And you, you know, your mom calls you down for dinner and then you have to show up at the dinner table as if you're still living in the real world and not living on the island with Jack and everyone. And it's like, yeah. it, it kind of makes you absent from real life. And I think TV shows, TV shows require more investment to get you to that point. You know, I have to get like half a season into Lost. That's like 10 hours or something to get to that point of like, I'm now not living in real life. With this book, I reached that point much quicker and there's like a lot less for, you know, the, the, a lot of things have to be in place for me to watch 10 hours of Lost to get to that point. I have to be, you know, at home pretty much on my computer. With, with a Kindle and a book, you can get to that point in like one hour for a book like Ready Player One. And you can get to that point in the back of an Uber. And then suddenly you're, you're now absent from the rest of your life and you have to finish this book. Otherwise, like you're not going to be able to do anything. And I, th I think that's a negative. I think it, it was it was too easy to get to that point with this book. It disrupted sort of my my mindset and my thinking for a few days. Um, and also, I don't think the book had any lasting value for me. It was pure like garbage entertainment <laughs> it's like yeah like i don't think there's anything from it that would stick with me it was a cool story that i spent a few days immersed in what do you think about that and i i, I think this is you know everyone's always like oh my god books 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 blah 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 this was less valuable than watching anime i think okay so i would agree with you in that reading most fiction is equivalent to watching most tv shows and that it probably doesn't leave you with anything particularly tangible um i had a s sort of similar experience earlier today where i was in the final three hours of uh, the second book in a, like this 15 book fantasy series uh, called uh, the the Wheel of Time, uh, and I was I was listening I was listening to it on Audible. By the way, if you haven't got an Audible account, go to audiblecom aliabdal to get your free trial. Uh, cheeky little plug there. <laughs> um, and I was I was listening to it on Audible, and it was getting to like a really good bit because at the end of these fantasy books, obviously you have the climax, um, sort of about three hours before the end. And then I was like, oh my god! And then I actively went to the gym and actively you know volunteered to go shopping and stuff to get groceries just because I wanted to have my AirPods in. Uh, oh, nice. in, uh, so that I could I could just listen to more of this audiobook and I timed it perfectly and just as I was coming sort of driving back back to the house kind of approaching the parking spot the book ended and it had a little background music being like copyright audible you know that, that sort <laughs> yeah. of stuff but I, I, I was fully engrossed in it to the point where I was thinking you know what I actually wanted to do something today I wanted to prepare for my next theology supervision but I'd rather just listen to this audiobook and I think I think that's fine like it's it's okay for us to become engrossed, engrossed in those sorts of worlds I think obviously it's a problem if it's happening too much and the issue that I've I found with TV shows is that when you're into a series it becomes the default activity that you do when you get home from work or from school or whatever and that means that all the other things in our lives do naturally take kind of second place to that and for me personally being someone who values productivity and kind of producing stuff that I think is adding some level of value to the world I don't really want to be in a position where I have such an easy default as turning on Netflix and I actually think the, the, the point you made was that it, it takes 10 hours of investment into a series like Lost whereas for a book you can be hooked immediately and kind of just get into it within like an hour um i'd probably disagree with that i think the more you read the more you separate and the and and the more you formulate your own reading rituals so like for example i'm only going to ever listen to audio audiobooks when i'm not in the house or when i'm at the gym or when i'm in the car and that means that that sort of time is cordoned off for audiobooks i'm, I'm only ever going to listen to podcasts when i'm driving to work i'm never going to listen to them at home i'm only ever going to read sort of this one particular series in night on my kindle in bed i wouldn't sit on the sofa just reading it randomly unless you know that one once, once every six months period happens where I'm like, okay, right, it's just got to a really good book. I, I just have to finish the book. And I think there's value in being able to take the time to savor those particular moments as well. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I I agree that a book like Ready Player One would probably have no lasting value, but also most TV shows and most movies have no lasting value. And I don't think that lasting value is necessarily the best proxy for, uh, is, is necessarily the best measure for um, sort of the value of entertainment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. Um, I'm, I'm totally with you. I think, But uh, my, my beef was that... I 
feel like I've been sold this narrative that like, oh, reading is always good and TV is always bad, blah, 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 this kind of thing. When like me reading that book, that was pure hedonism. That, that was like, yeah, I, I guess it's like a hedonistic pleasure, which by the way, I'm a big fan of. And I think like it's one of, you know, being immersed in these like worlds that don't exist is one of the great pleasures in life. But I don't think people are, I don't know. I just don't like the whole narrative around like books being in, intrinsically like really good. Like yeah, you, you did your video recently about, oh, how I read a hundred books a year. Um, um, and like the fact that that is, the fact that that was the clickbait title you chose suggests that society is in a weird place where like reading books is, is I, I'm not trying to rail against reading books. I'm just trying to say that like it, it can be pretty hedonistic and sort of temporary. And this this certainly oh, yeah. was for me. Yeah, I, 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 I fully agree. Um, I, I tweeted something a few months ago where I was I was I was talking about how I'd it was it was again it, this uh, it was it was a book by John Gwynn and it was this other fantasy book. And I just kind of read it for like three hours in bed. And and the thing that I tweeted was that I wonder if I'd spent that three hours watching TV instead, if I would have kind of beaten myself up more about it, because there's that narrative that yeah. watching TV is bad and reading books is good. Exactly. Even though this was like a pure a pure hedonism fantasy book, I wasn't even reading most of the description. I was skimming through it because I wanted to get to the good bits and get to the, the fun stuff, the action and the romance, obviously, uh, sometimes both at the same time. Um, <laughs> but there were there were so many responses to that tweet of people kind of defending the reading thing. And so, so a couple of people made the point that, oh, well, I guess when you're reading, you're actually putting work in oh, and therefore not that it's, again. it's like that satisfaction it's, it's like that satisfaction that you get when you've done when you've completed a project or when you've kind of used your hands to create something it feels a bit more a, a bit more kind of kind of satisfactory than just being a pure consumer of something at least that was the impression that, that some people were giving G give me a break i don't buy that stuff i think that's uh i think that's people trying to justify uh the narratives that they've been fed anyway um yeah i read a book that's my insight of the week <laughs> uh, con congratulations that's incredible um <laughs> my insight of the week is actually uh, related to productivity in some sense, uh, as, as always. Surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> and that is that re recently, for, like for the past few weeks, I've started doing this thing where at the start of every day, I'll ask myself, what do I want my highlight of the day to be? And that is either based on urgency or satisfaction or joy. And I just pick a single thing that I'm going to do for that day. Um, and I found that like, sin like on, 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 on days when I do that, it just gives me a good default task to do when I'm not doing anything else. And so like the other day I had to write this course outline for a new class I'm working on on Skillshare and I've been putting it off for ages but then I, I just put it as my highlight for the day and I got it done by the end of the day uh, and the day before that was we was prepared for the supervision and I ended up getting it done and that meant that once that task for the day was done I felt like oh today's been a win now I don't I actually don't have to worry when I get home about kind of being more productive I can just kind of do what I feel like and so and sure so sometimes I'll feel like doing something more productive because all the productive things I do I enjoy anyway but sometimes I'll just kind of be like you know what I'm just gonna just gonna drive to the gym listen to my audiobook for the next three hours <laughs> call it a day uh, and <laughs> uh, I say trying to be non-productive by going to the gym uh, but yeah th so th that was my insight of the week as it were that you know just picking a highlight of the day and, and kind of kind of actively writing it down uh, I found to be quite like, like surprisingly helpful that sounds pretty good maybe I'll give that a go this week you should try it out man all right it's been good chatting yeah nice to catch up uh, thank you everyone for listening and see you next week